The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Net Wealth Investments Limited, ABN 85090 569 109, AFSL 230 975, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Advice Tech. As if it wasn't enough to be across TMDs, Alpha, Beta, Rule of 72 and all the other nuances of financial advice. Now, advisors are expected to be across all the technology options too. And there's so many of them. But never fear, Peter D is here. Join me each week on a journey of discovery through the software and apps on offer for advisors and advice businesses. So let's dive in, fellow advice explorers. This episode is brought to you by NetWealth, market-leading providers of technology, excellent customer support and expertise to help your wealth business thrive. Rated number one for overall satisfaction and value for money by Investment Trends and Chant West's Advised Product of the Year for the last four years, NetWealth is here to support you on your advice technology journey. See wealth differently and visit the website to learn how NetWealth can support your advice and wealth business. Hello and welcome to the XY Advice Tech Podcast. Wow, that was a tongue twister there for a minute, folks. I'm Peter Diamantidis, and this week we're going to deep dive into LinkedIn. And joining me here today to give us a bit of a helping hand is an author, a cruise speaker, a commissioner of declarations, and a laptop lifestyler. Thank you so much for joining me on the show, Adam Hallahan. Woo! Welcome, welcome. Hey, Peter. Thank you. Wonderful to be here with you today. Not uh, not on the beach with the laptop to, right now in the in the studio at the office, but, uh, but yes, uh, don't mind uh, doing a bit of work from the beach every now and then, like uh, every second day. I feel like I'm underachieving. That feels like an ultimate goal for me if I can be sitting on a beach with my laptop. You've given me a mission now. I'm going to get there. And we're leading into summer. It's perfect timing. All righty. Well, we're going to pick your brain about LinkedIn in just a uh, just a minute, but I did want to take a little bit of a moment to get to know you a bit better through your use of technology. So tell me, what is your most used emoji? Do you use emojis at all? Uh, I, I'm going to say yes, and uh, though I'm going to say is sparingly. Okay. Uh, and in, I mean that in context of LinkedIn uh, because uh, you know, LinkedIn is kind of a professional platform, which you know, we're going to get into in a minute. But uh, so yes, I do, uh, and generally speaking, it uh, it'll usually be the like the thumbs up uh, one uh, mm-hmm. if I use them. Uh, however, if it's in a personal context and uh, it's uh, you know, talking to my wife about the kids or whatever, it's the eye roll. So uh, <laughs> it's uh, yeah, it just depends on the context, but it's those two. You know what? I don't think I'm using the eye roll enough. You've just inspired me to go to that and tap into my, you know, teenage girl <laughs> eye rolling that I'm sure I did to my parents. I love it. And in, and so then if you had to, you know, wipe off all the apps off your phone and just keep three, which keep three do you think you'd keep? Goodness me, only three. Uh, <laughs> first of all, it'd take, it'd take me about three hours to, to wipe them all off my phone. But, uh, okay, three. Well, LinkedIn clearly would be, would be my number one go yep. to. Uh, Voxer would be my number two because that's, okay. uh, kind of how we communicate. We, we've got a team all over the world. Uh, so, uh, Voxer's kind of my, uh, and Slack. So they're the, they're the communication tools we use. Uh, so they'd be my three. So yeah, LinkedIn number one. Voxer and Slack. Interesting. So you're using Voxer in addition to Slack. Yeah. So Slack is, uh, you know, like, you know, all the channels and all that sort of stuff. Mm. But uh, if I'm kind of on the run, uh, I'm often not in the office, uh, traveling to events and Mm. and things like that. uh, I'll just quickly bang out a a voice message to one of the team on on Voxer. And they also know if like, um, you know, I will check in on on Slack all the time during the day. Well, you know, at periodically during mm. the day but if it's a what we call blood on the floor moment um then it's get, get on hit me in boxer and you know they know I'll, I'll respond immediately i love that blood on the floor uh, yeah fingers crossed none of us have too many of those right going forward 
yeah, but you never know. It's so unpredictable. All righty, let's deep dive into LinkedIn. So listening today, I sort of want to give some context. So the, we'll have, you know, salaried staff might be listening, whether that's advisors or maybe support staff, but we could also have business owners and even people a bit like myself who, I guess, like yourself, speaker, you know, sort of content creator. So there's sort of different types of users in that sense that will be listening. So how do you think they each should be using it differently? Is there a different approach? You know, is there a, for, let's start with the salaried sort of individual. Cause I think that's probably a bit unloved in lots of advice given on social media. Yeah. You know, if, if you work for somebody, how can you be using a tool like LinkedIn better? Yeah, exactly. And it is very different to, uh, to how say the, the, the business or the key person in the business would, uh, would use it. So there's really like three, three things we break it down into. Uh, and so, so the, that first one you're talking about is very much, uh, and it depends on their role, of course, as well. So the one thing I'd say, Peter, is that, um, everybody in the organization should have a LinkedIn profile. And they all should have a, a professional you know, profile, meaning that it's um, you know it's uh, it's aligned with the business, and that you know it's it looks presentable. Uh, it's surprising how often uh, we go into sort of larger corporates, uh, and it's just a dog's breakfast of uh, you know from you know some some of the people in the and I'm talking about the leadership level teams. Uh, that have uh, really, really average LinkedIn profiles. So, so the so number one thing is have a professional profile. Uh, the second part is really, you know, they should be pro- most likely connecting with and interacting with um, uh, people that are aligned with the organisation. And that might be um, that might be um, uh, service providers to the business right. that they're, that they're working with individually. It might be, you know. Uh, People that they want to work with, that let's say sales teams or things like that. Clearly, that's a very different use as well because they're going to be more of an outreach and connecting with uh, people for the to view of getting into conversations. Uh, so, so the use cases are going to vary depending on the department. Uh, but if we had an overarching sort of uh, simple strategy, it's it's you know uh, reaching out, and connecting with the the people that are aligned with the the organization, but also within the world of that particular person. And you know, the other thing, Peter, it's got to be really, it's one of those, those if very, very interesting uh, anomalies within uh, who, who actually owns the profile. Uh, and there's, there are actual uh, uh, court cases where the individual's profile was deemed to be owned by the organization or wow. the individual depending on how it was set up and how it's used. So what I would say is, and as I know you didn't ask the question, but no. it's, uh, it's a very, very important topic, is that there has to be really clear guidelines uh, for, you know, when, say, you're bringing in new team members as to what is the expected use of their LinkedIn profile uh, and what is it agreed that, uh, you know, that the uh, – I'll give you an example. So when, when people uh, join – us in their um, employment agreement there is a section that clearly states that yes you, you're going to use the background image banner, you know, uh, of, of the company you, you agree to put a position description about the organization you agree to act in certain you know certain ways professionally and you agree for your profile to be tagged as part of our company uh, profile that yeah you know, little things like that yeah uh, now if you're talking about um, Sales people, as an example, then there's a, then you get into some some slippery slopes of uh, of um, you know what is the, what is expected and uh, what is ultimate ownership. So we don't, we don't want to go down that that mm. uh, that uh, you know, rabbit hole, but it's just something that all organisations at the level that uh, you know a lot of your listeners are going to be uh, at today to be very wary of and get some good advice on uh, and, and build it into the hint, hint here, <laughs> build build it into your employment agreements as to what uh, what is expected uh, and uh, including co- you know, code of conduct. Uh, you, you really, really don't want uh, people in the organisation being, uh, you know, might have a, a very strong opinion, say, for example, in a certain topic, 
that is detrimental to the vision and mission of the organisation. Now, of course, we can't ask them to change their their opinion. We can just ask them not to air that opinion. Sure. I think the other thing, um, I think the other side of or the flip side of that is is true for a lot of people maybe working, it could even be a small business, but even a bigger one, is they just don't post at all. Like they, they're so fearful of all of that. They just don't post at all. And I think, you know, if you're a leader of a team or, you know, run a business, then I, th- I feel like it's an untapped resource is the extent to which your staff can engage with the public. I think that's very exactly. untapped and their insights are so different. And so perhaps it's just about better guidance, guidance, you know, perhaps. 100% Peter, it is all about guidance and, and having, you know, uh, rules of the game. And let's face it, the you know it uh, it, it is a professional platform, uh, but the, and again, if I use our organisation as an example, uh, our our team that are in sales, they have a very different use of and, and allowance of what they can and can't do, uh, in, including creating their own content. But they have to create that content within a guideline. Uh, but our other team member, you know, that are in our marketing team and IT team and uh, coaches and things like that. Quite often, you know, we're uh, encouraging them to share the, you know, the company content or uh, pose an opinion on, on mm. that content, but also to uh, be interacting, engaging on our clients' content where, where it's appropriate. So, so there's very different use cases uh, depending on you know where in the you know, what the role is that those people are doing, um, and that's why it really needs a, a very clear kind of outline as to hey. You know, in the employment agreement, this this is you know, this is kind of the we call it the rules of the game, but uh, it's just the guideline, really, as you said. And it is, and it doesn't need to be, you know, really, really strict. I know there's some very large institutions that may have people listening to this podcast who, you know, you're allowed to post the marketing edited post that everybody posts on the thing. And that's it, really. Like it's it's really prescriptive. It doesn't need to be that. You could have a piece of content that you or somebody else has written in your business, and then your team can just share it with their take. Oh, check out page number two. I was fascinated by. Or you know, like you can they can give their window in whatever they would say in a conversation with somebody. They can do that way of introducing the piece of content. So I just think, like you say, have a meeting where you just debate the content. Talk about it. What was interesting? Right. Well, that sounds like you, that's your post. You know, like I think we can train teams to to comfortably and well, you know, with a great deal of thought, post on these things without it being thou shalt not. You know, a hundred percent. And in, in all honesty, when the, and you are correct, there are organisations that get you know, <laughs> lock it down that tight. Uh, the interesting part, though, is that uh, quite often their social presence. I was actually pretty boring. Oh, uh, it's 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 just horrendous, off. and yeah. uh, it's quite obvious that. Well, it can't, do you know what, Peter? It actually comes across more that the that the team just don't care, yeah, because you know it just looks like they're they're not really interacting, or you can almost tell that their responses are pre-scripted, or uh, as opposed to you know allow that yes have some guidelines, but allow them their own personality. It's it's going to do the company or business a lot value um if they you know if, if they're allowed to have a little bit of you know light and shade in the way that they they express an opinion so in terms then um you just made me realize that something that business owners um could do for their stuff they really want to make this sort of push of all right let's just lift our linkedin presence at least lift the sort of quality of what we've got on there when we actually did a couple of years it must have been just before COVID, i think um we did a team strategy day but during the day we had a photographer come and take both posed and sort of animated photos of the team so it meant they all had product proper headshots and none of them ever had had that before you know these are admin and support stuff they just never never had a headshot before so and that doesn't need to be expensive you know you can do that and suddenly the photo on there looks like something actually <laughs> professional. You know? it, it does. And, you know, there's even, um, there's even photographers around now that have created businesses of doing headshots, but they do them remotely, just the tech that is available now. Uh, we had some of our team's uh, headshots done uh, from a photographer in the UK. <gasps> you know, we're based here in Australia. Wow. Uh, and it was all done 
you know, uh, yes, the you know, team members had to download an app onto their phone and, and then you know, certain things happened and, and then the day, a day later, they just sent back these amazing headshots from the other side of the world. So, you know, you don't even have to be you know, saying, oh, well, we've got to wait until our corporate day or whatever where yeah. everyone's in the office. The, the tech exists now to, uh, to do almost everything remotely. That's fantastic. And I've, I've written that down because we've got some virtual staff. Uh, I mean, we all operate virtually, but most of us in Australia, but we do have some overseas. So, and I really wanted to get some good headshots for them. So you've just given me a winning idea. Thank you. That's fantastic. So then, okay. So that's the, for the salary. Then, of course, we've got, you know, the either more senior personnel, business or owner, thought leader. Let me ask you this. What's your take on the business page on LinkedIn? Like, is that worth doing at all? Is it really, eh, it's not worth your time? What are, what are your thoughts? You know, interesting, but if you'd asked me this question two years ago, I'd give you the complete polar opposite of what I'm going to give you now. Uh, uh, now I'd say, yes, every organisation, no matter the size, should have a company profile, a company page, as they call mm-hmm. it, uh, because there's a lot of functionality that uh, has been added to company pages that was not there before huh. that now makes it almost a prerequisite. Uh, well, I'll preface that by saying provided you, you're really looking to use your company's LinkedIn presence you know, in a lead generation um, tool. Right, right. Uh, now, uh, you know, we talked about you know, the, the team. Uh, obviously, that's a different thing, but now the business itself. Uh, and I'll, 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 again, be fair and say not every single business is going to want to use their profile for that purpose, but yep. I can guarantee you 90% of them will, um, then yes, you 100% you're going to have to have a, a company page. It's going to have to be active. You've got to be you know, building followers to the page. So there's a little bit of work to do. And, of course, the uh, content, uh, the big mistake that I see all the time, Peter, is people are, um, you know, just the content on the company page is, is often done by, say, the marketing team. Right. Uh, understandable, uh, or an ex, uh, a, or an outsourced marketing team, or whatever, and right. all they're really doing is is you know uh, adding links to blog posts and stuff like that, uh, that that's on the company website. And I'm not saying there's any wrong with adding links to blog posts, things like <laughs> that. It just shouldn't all be that. You yeah, know? It, it needs to have a variety. That you've got to give the the uh, the company, the organisation, the personality, and uh, a reason for people to want to go to the page. It's interesting you say that because I'm just reflecting on that for financial advice because, of course, it's fair to say we're not the most interesting or sexy industry out there. So, so, you know, bringing personality to these things is not necessarily natural, but you've just made me realize some of the things I love seeing, um, on company pages, but even on websites is the, a bit of the behind the scenes, you know, a bit of the, well, how actually do you get that done? And that's not something that in financial advice we ever really share. Like we'd never really show, well, this is all the graphs we might look at if we're trying to check this out for you. Or this is, you know, those sort of things actually can deeply connect people to either your business or yourself, but also establish that expert status because it's like, oh, goodness, that looks really complicated. <laughs> like, wow, you guys really exactly. know your stuff, you know. <laughs> yeah, and it's that, it's the age-old thing, isn't it, Peter? It's, you know, we're often um, blinded by the fact of how good we are at whatever we do and thinking, well, everybody knows that. That's, that's, yeah. that's, the reality is that they don't, and, and you're right. That's the type of content that people actually really like. It's, it's just seeing that behind the scenes uh, sort of view of things. Um, yeah, it could be. Uh, it, all, it could also be as simple as um, how your team uh, researches. You know, obviously, especially in financial services, there's, yeah. there's a lot of uh, a lot of research involved, uh, a lot of um, uh, compliance, that type of thing, and, and whilst. Uh, I, I know yeah, we, we have, have clients in, in financial services, so uh, reasonably across how, um, how much time and effort is actually put into uh, maintaining your, your level of um, currency on, mm. on what's going on uh, through all the, the point system and all, all that type of thing. Uh, but actually, that's quite interesting stuff. It's, uh, you know, we want to know that our financial uh, advisor is, is on his or her game. Yeah. Uh, so... As simple as that. Hey, you know, oh, it's blocked out half the day today to uh, you know 
get up to speed on X, Y, Z. That's uh, uh, you know, and put a bit of a personal spin on uh, you know your thoughts on that. That that's actually content that uh, people go, hmm, wow, yeah, didn't realize you guys have to do that. Uh, no wonder you charge me so much. <laughs> Well, and it's interesting you say that. I mean, XY, the podcast we're on, XY have um, two days a year where it's a whole day of CPD virtually and they sort of do that so we can, you know, sort of go hard and really knock it out. And and it, I might share, you know, me watching that from my – I sort of set up the living room and, you know, I, I airstream it to the TV and so you can all see it happening. But but I had it hadn't occurred to me to almost on the business page go, this is us keeping up to date for our work exactly. with you. You know, like really positioning it that way. Exactly. And imagine imagine if you got, um, you know, all of your team, you know, as you said, they're all sort of remote. Uh, but if everybody on that those two days, you know, kind of took a selfie or, or someone t- taken of them, you know, so you, there's the way you do it, but you stream it onto your TV and there's someone else, you know, uh, uh, in their pyjamas or, 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 you know, whatever you, people are comfortable with, of yeah. course, but um, uh, where, you know, how interesting would that then be to see, you know, uh, hey, we're all, we're all on the same page, we're all doing the same thing, but we're all doing it in our own way that, you know, people will definitely resonate with that, that type of content. And it's the type of content people just never, organisations, I should say, just never really think and that, uh, that uh, uh, will be interesting to people. Uh, and I guarantee you every time that will be the, the ones that get the most uh, – traction interaction yeah that is, and and when in finance you know we're particularly light on with the whole experiential stuff you know <laughs> so the we need to sort of tap into our heston blumenthal and and make this stuff sort of more interesting and think about the experience more because i do think you know that yes there's it's nerdy but it's really interesting to other people like oh is that what it's like you know like it's fascinating and there's lots of people that that have a secret wish to understand more about finance and how we do things so you know why yeah. not share and i think the uh the one thing we should talk about uh too peter is especially in in financial services is of course there there is a degree of um structure around what can and can't be said yeah uh when you're talking about financial advice However, when you're talking about the back scene, the backstory of how the organisation is is a or has a life and a, you know, a team and stuff like that, that's that's open. You know, we can we can say and do as we please because it's it's the reality of what's going on. Uh, so often, you know, when we're working with some of our clients in that space, it's always initially the conversation goes down. Oh, well, I've got to be so careful in what I say, and I can't do this. And that's fine. Let's just lift that out because nobody gives a rat's part about it anyway just yeah. frankly what they want to know is the you know the, the life and the behind the scenes of, of the organization so so let's go super light on that stuff yes of course when we share it stay within the guidelines don't don't um don't give advice so to speak uh but uh you know let's have more of our content really in the stuff that uh, is interesting and uh it's very it's, it's got a bit of variety to it uh, and when I say variety, it's uh, that's also across different um, uh, posting uh, uh, concepts. So you've got standard status posts, you've got uh, posts with images, you've got short videos, you've got newsletters, uh, all these different things. So you, you, the pa- company page needs to have a bit of a variety, uh, as as does the uh, profile of the key. So yeah, you know, maybe the founder, the CEO, whoever's the yep. face of the organisation. Uh, it's the exact same rules apply, just content might be slightly different. It's interesting. So you mentioned um, newsletter there, and I think it's something that, like, as users of LinkedIn, we might have sort of come across it that somebody's, you know, there's a notification. Somebody's asked you to be, <laughs> but we probably aren't as aware of it as an actual function that we could take aware of. Do you want to just run us through, like, how that's different um, to yeah. just a post, you know, and why that might have some benefits? Yeah, absolutely. It is a really uh, uh, important. It, it's reasonably recent that company mm. pages could have its own newsletter. Uh, us as individuals, we've been able to have an, our own newsletter for some time. Uh, but now, uh, as uh, I give it again, using us as an example, so I have my own uh, personal newsletter, and then we have a company newsletter. Uh, of course, the contents just little bit different Mm -hmm. Uh, but in the concept of what we're talking about here it's definitely uh, so every company page can have one newsletter and the value of the newsletter is it's long-form content 
uh, as opposed to everything else is generally very short, punchy type of content. Mm. Uh, but also, people can subscribe to your newsletter. So you definitely should be you know, reaching out to your clients and uh, say, hey, here's, you know, we've got this uh, user on LinkedIn, uh, click here and you know, get that notification, things like that. Uh, but the uh, So you can actually have a subset of, of um, uh, clients or, or interested parties that follow your newsletter, and uh, the more that LinkedIn sees that you have you're building followers to that particular piece of content, uh, the more inclined they are to uh, sh- one make sure that those people subscribe clearly get notified by notification on LinkedIn. Clearly, it's coming up in their feeds, but also by uh, they send you an email saying, "Hey." Um, uh, XY's just released a new uh, newsletter today. Here it is. So they're, they're actually helping you get it out there. But also behind the scenes, they're also working out who are the people who are subscribing to it, who are the, the uh, people who are interacting on it. And they're starting to show that to more of what a wider community of people beyond just your followers or connections or anything like that. Okay. Because what LinkedIn's trying, what they're not even trying, they've actually been very successful at is is trying to uh, ensure we all see the type of content we really like. Uh, there's a number of ways you can actually um, uh, determine or uh, have a say in what shows up in your feed. Most people don't do it or are unaware of it, but uh, there's also a way LinkedIn's kind of, you know, they they can't, you've all heard of in Facebook terminology lookalike audiences. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it's kind of similar to that concept where it's like, okay, I'm not connected to these people. I don't know these people, but LinkedIn knows that the people who I am connected to and who are interacting with my content, that these other people out there are kind of the same type of people and it's in their interest to at least show it to them to see whether they like it and want to engage on it. And, of course, you know, that helps the organisation to expand its reach uh, organically. Okay. And is this – this is outside of – I mean, I know I've followed – some hashtags on LinkedIn. It took me a while to discover those. Um, and it meant that changed my feed a bit. So it's, it's sort of, it's doing that sort of more organically behind the scene. It's, it's saying, well, that sort of thing that you're producing, I reckon those people over there would find that valuable as opposed to where we all are quite prescriptive about our, gee, I liked that or somebody commented or I'm, we're, you know, I'm connected to them. It's, it's actually a bit broader than that of what people can see yeah. of your content. Okay. So, so you, again, your company page can um, attribute up to three hashtags to the page. Yep. Uh, so it kind of you know, it gives people an idea of what, you know, what the organisation is all about. Uh, on your personal profile, uh, you can do up to five, with the, what's called creator mode, and you should. Okay. <laughs> um, and the, but also like, like you did, you can, uh, you can go out and say, okay, the, this particular hashtag, I like that. Uh, yeah, that's the content I'm interested in. And uh, the, by the way, if you'd like to see all my content shop your feed, look for the hashtag Adam's View and uh, <laughs> follow that. And then uh, you're guaranteed to start seeing all my stuff. Okay. Uh, same thing for the company. You know, you should have a company uh, hashtag uh, and you share that on every piece of content that you create. I'll give you a quick little. Um, uh, like case study of why that's important. Uh, some time ago now, uh, I had somebody reach out to, hey, like, uh, have a chat about what you guys do. I cut to the chase, they became a client. And after that, I said, oh, yeah, how did you find out about us? He said, oh, somebody just told me about uh, your content and, um, uh, and I looked on your profile, I found it. Uh, I saw you had this hashtag Adam's view. I clicked on it, and uh, before I knew it, I'd binged six hours of your content. And uh, over a weekend, uh, in my head, I was thinking, "Wow, you kind of find better things to do on a weekend than <laughs> spend six hours on my yeah, content." Bless, but, uh, but really? hey, thank you, but thank you. <laughs> but, but so the point being, the point being that uh, hashtags really, really important on two fronts. Uh, one for you to, to make sure you see the right type of content in your feed. And two for outbound when the organization is and the, the key people who are creating content personally within the organization are using hashtags very strategically. Interesting. Okay. And so that's, a, that's something that's different than just tagging 
the company page. Yeah. You know, this is a hashtag as well. And so that's sort of making it a bit broader than that. It's it's almost becoming its own theme then. You're becoming your own your own topic uh, in that that's sense. And, yeah, okay, powerful. So let's talk about then pro- the profile, the LinkedIn profile. There's got to be so many features on there that you just can't believe people don't use. You know, are there a few of those that stand out for you? They're like, would you all please just turn these things on or or add some information to them? What are most people missing on their LinkedIn profile? Yeah, you know, you know, Peter, you'd be really surprised to know that uh, yeah, there's, there's ballpark 850 million people on LinkedIn and less than 5% of that 850 million people actually have a profile that makes any sense. What I mean by makes any sense, I mean it makes any sense algorithmically to LinkedIn whereby they can understand the, the flow of the, the profile mm-hmm. and therefore actually can sh- be shown in searches by LinkedIn. So that, that gives you an, an idea of, <laughs> of uh, how, how well overall we do in that, sta- <laughs> that space. But you're right. There's you know the eighty twenty rule. There's there's a, a few little things that will get you eighty percent of the, the uh, traction. And what they are is 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 three three key things. Well, actually four. There's the, the background banner image. You know you've got to have a professional image. You've got to have something that uh, you know if you if you've got nothing, there is a placeholder there. But uh, you can think about it. Uh, imagine I came to your website and you just had a placeholder at the, the top of the website. Yeah. That tells me you just don't really care uh, yeah. about your website. Same as on your LinkedIn profile. If, if there's not something there, it just says you don't care. Um, the second part is, of course, as you alluded to earlier, uh, is a good professional uh, profile image. Um, and now almost always you know, uh, some people have a profile image, but there's a big difference between a good one and a, and a bad one. Mm-hmm. Uh, a bad one can be uh, a number of things. So if you guys, if you're doing any of these things, uh, you need up time to update. So if your profile image is 20 years out of date, you need to update it. Uh, now, and, and reason why is why why is that really important? Because at the end of the day, what we're using our profile for is to get in conversations with people, whether mm-hmm. that's you know, live. Like imagine, imagine this, Peter. Imagine uh, I've uh, connected with one of your advisors. On LinkedIn, had a chat. Great, I'm going to come in next week and uh, let's talk about um, you know, what we can do together. And I walk in the door, and the person that greets me there is 20 years older than the person I had in my head on, on the profile image. There's an immediate disconnection. There's immediate uh, creation of, of distrust. Yeah. Uh, so it's a bigger issue than what most people think. Equally, if uh, put on. A bit of weight since uh, your last right. photo, or you've lost a lot of weight since your last photo. Again, there's just this, you know, it's it's got to be current uh, for for the ladies. Often, you know, change of hairstyle, uh, not so much just a little change in style, but if say complete change of color, mm-hmm. nothing like that. Uh, update your photo, guys. Let's yeah. Keep it right. You know. So that's number two. Uh, number three is the professional headline. That's what you write about yourself directly under your profile. Uh, you've got about uh, 240 characters of text to put in there. Uh, there's lots of different ways to do that. But one of the worst ways is to allow LinkedIn to just put as a default your, um, which, and which they will, if you don't uh, put something better there, is uh, whatever your position description is. So it might say, okay. you know, CEO of Promise Glow, oh, that's not sure. the title I use, but it's, you know, yeah. uh, that's a massive waste of the, a huge opportunity real to get estate. people to have a, a sense of who you are and what you're about. Uh, and the last one is hashtags, as we said. This is, there's a um, thing on your profile. Everybody's got access to it. It doesn't matter whether you've got a free account or premium accounts or anything like that. It's everybody has it called Creator Mode. And you just have to go to your dashboard and at the very top of it, you'll see it says Creator Mode on or off. Uh, Now, if it's off, uh, then it doesn't give you the opportunity to attribute up to five hashtags to your profile. So, and that is the number one, uh, if if you said out of all those things, what's the one thing that the highest majority of people are not using? It's that one. Okay. And it's something that, um, what I liked about doing it, so when I came across, and I'm pretty sure actually I came across it because I attended one of your live web events and I just went, Oh, okay. I better do that. Um, and because I am an opinionated person, so I do have things that I talk about <laughs> frequently, um, is that when you're forced to come up with five things, 
it really gets to think about it gets you to think about your messaging. It really gets you to think about well, what actually are the things that I want to be known for? And I think that's a good process, right? Because it forces you not to just be sort of blathering about anything. Um, you'll be prescriptive because you've put that down there as this is what I'm focusing on. Of course, it means you can post on something else, but I think it's a good thought process for anybody to really sort of focus on well, what do I want to be known for on a social media platform like LinkedIn? Um, so it really sort of pushes you to consider that carefully. Yeah, it does. Uh, and the other thing is it, it also will help a great deal in, because uh, what LinkedIn is trying to do is they're trying to make an alignment um, between the, what you put there in your hashtags and overall on your profile, uh, the type of people you're connecting with. And by the way, again, if you, uh, I know you didn't ask me, I'm going to give it to you anyway. <laughs> was you know, one of the big mistakes people make. Uh, the number one mistake, I believe, is accepting connection requests from just everyone and anyone. Right. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's kind of like that dopamine hit. It's like, oh, somebody wants to connect to me. That's awesome. I'm going to accept. Um, you're far better off to be very selective in, uh, in who you're connected with because that's what's happening. It's uh, LinkedIn's looking for this three way alignment what your profile says you're all about, who you're connecting with, and what's the content you're actually creating and, and sharing or interacting on. Uh, when they can see that alignment between those three, then it goes clearly, okay, well, within reason, we, we know who your tribe is, even if you don't. Yeah. Uh, now, when if you don't have if your, your um, hashtags and all your profiles all over the place and you're connecting with anyone and everyone and today you're talking about topic A and tomorrow it's topic B and then it's, it's about what you did on the weekend and all that stuff, they just go, oh, my goodness, I don't know what the heck's going on here. Let's just not show Peter's profile to anyone. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's what happens. And actually that brings up a, an interesting question and, and, you know, I'm a good example of this. So as somebody, so I own and run a financial advice practice, um, but I also talk to advisors you know, about advice tech. So, so it's an interesting, you know, how do you handle that when you've sort of got, you know, two sides to your audience, you've got the the public or your niche or, you know, whoever you're talking to in that way, and they could be on LinkedIn, but also there's your peers, you know, in the industry. How do you think is the best way to handle that in terms of either the hashtags or just your content generally? Yeah, it's a great question, uh, and and one of the ones that's it's uh, it actually is easy to resolve, but most people uh, don't go about it the right way. Uh, the reality is, you've got to pick one of them uh, as far as the you know what you do on your personal profile, uh, and then of course you can. And I I'll give an example. Um, you know, I've often had people say to me, "Oh, but uh, I've got three businesses," uh, and I go, "Yeah, pick one." Uh, like, what about the other two? So I don't care about the other two. Pick one. Um, you know, you've, you've got to stay within a lane. You can't be all things to all people on your personal profile. However, of course, on your company page, you can have a whole different. So your company page can be, uh, you know, for a different audience. So as you said, either you know, your, your clients on one, peers on the other, but also you can have what's called showcase pages. Uh, showcase pages are like a subset of your company page. So you can have as many showcase pages as you like, and therefore, in, in your example, in that case for you, I would be recommending that you know your personal profile is very much about the, the your your clients. Mm -hmm. um, you your company page mostly about your clients as well, but then have some showcase pages that might be for peers and, and you know other subsets that you think are, are relevant. Now, word of warning, of course, once, yeah, the more of those you create, the more content you've got to create because <laughs> each one then has to have its own followers and, and its own content and, and whatever. Yeah, okay. So be careful for, be careful what you, I'll give you the, I'll give you the solution, but uh, the solution may be uh, yeah, a lot of work in front of you. Absolutely. One of the things that I um, sort of accidentally came across as a, one of the features on the profile actually is the um, the voice where you can record how to say your name. And as somebody with a ridiculous name to say, I've had so many comments of gratitude from people like MCs at events because, you know, I'll speak and the, the poor people have to introduce me. Um, and they've commented I was so – because they hadn't seen it very often that not many people have actually turned that on where you just say – say your name and even a simple name I think it's worth doing like it's them hearing you say your name so they know how to introduce you or they know how to refer to you you know it's powerful it is and that's what it was uh, that was is exactly what it was created for um, however there's two use cases for every almost everything on LinkedIn 
So in the context where you do have a name that's somewhat difficult to pronounce like yours, (laughs) 100% you should be using it for that. Uh, where that's not necessarily the case, like if uh, your name is Jack Jones, mm-hmm. as an example, um, <clears throat> then there's still a use case for it. Um, even though, you know, it's not going to be, nobody's conning and get Jack Jones wrong, but you actually have, uh, you know, you've got a good 10 seconds or so of, of um, recording there. Uh, so as an example, go and have a look at mine. Uh, when, you know, uh, and of course, I know you're going to share the link to my profile for everyone. Mm. Uh, go and have a look at that part Peter's talking about, uh, which you'll see it looks like a little microphone next to your name or my name in this case. And you'll see that when I use it, I actually kind of use it like a call to action. It's, hey, this is what we're about. This is what I want you to do next. I just do it within 10 seconds. Uh, so there's two very powerful ways to, to use that, that feature. That's a great tip. And I think you know, that's the case for lots of things, isn't it? Where you've just got to utilize it for what works for you. Just because it was created for, you know, version A doesn't mean that you need to use that um, going forward. And LinkedIn is one of those things that has, it has a lot of elements, doesn't it? I mean, even just to the profile, there is so many places you could fill things in. Um, I mean, I guess the obvious thing people do is their work history, which I get, but there's probably other elements there that people don't use. I'm betting that the featured section is probably one that people don't necessarily set up well. Is that correct? Yeah, 100%. It's, um, and it, uh, the featured section is an optional, so it's not there by default. Uh, you've got to go and activate it. And, of course, lots of people are just not even aware that, uh, that it's there. But it is. it allows you to uh, add... Uh, uh, video content, uh, links to, you know, stuff on your website or anywhere else. Uh, and the, the value of it is it's, it's very visual on your mm. profile. So again, we use that feature section as a really, uh, intrinsic part of setting up a, a, a profile. And if you, again, if you, if you went to my profile and you'll see it, you'll see, you know, if you clicked on the, you'll see there's like a, a, uh, video, where my profile image is and it gives you like sort of 20 seconds of um, me talking. But what you'll see is in it, I, I say, go to the featured section. If you read the professional headline below that, it says, go to the featured section. If you do that one you talked about with the name pronunciation, go to the featured section. Okay. So every part of those those things in the profile, we're driving people exactly to that, to that, that featured section. Now, the... the uh, Again, if we want to talk about how not to use the the uh, featured section, is don't put more than three links there. Okay. Uh, I, one, one to three, and, and I'll be fair, Peter, in saying this is you know my opinion. Uh, sure. And anyone else can have their own. The the worst example of this that I've seen uh, is someone had seventy eight links in their <laughs> featured section, which is just crazy to think you know people are going to swipe right all the time right so uh, that's not going to happen so you want it just very in your face visual that's three kind of uh format well on a desktop view Mm -hmm. uh on a mobile view it's just going to see one so and yes you can scroll but three three maximum because that's as many as as you're going to get in a good view on um on a um desktop view that's really helpful because it's um i know and it's this is one of those things, tech's so interesting, and, and we don't schedule enough of our updates on this stuff. And I don't mean posts. I mean, you know, maybe once in a quarter we should just go into our profile and freshen it up. Like just schedule these things to just keep it up to date because what happens is we let it go and then we are either going to announce something or we've got a new book. You and I have authors, you know, we something and you're like, you look at your profile and go, oh, no. <laughs> That's really out of date, right? And exactly. you've been wasting all of that engagement. I mean, you know, listeners, something you might find surprising, I think some of the biggest networks or, or followings we any of us have is actually on LinkedIn. I know mine is. My, my numbers on LinkedIn are much higher than they are anywhere else. You know, we're probably underutilizing that. You know, if we don't keep it up to date, the profile, then people are seeing stuff that is no longer really reflecting who we are and what we're doing. Yeah, it, it was interesting. Uh, you, you are one hundred percent correct. And a good example of that is uh, I was I was looking at um, uh, a profile of uh, somebody that was uh, so I was asked to have their profile to give my opinion on, uh, who was a branding expert. 
And in the background banner that we talked about earlier, he had um, uh, a it was referencing an event that he was hosting in 2019, <laughs> <laughs> and had the date had the date on there, and I was like, "Really? You you really want me to?" To, to, uh, you know, share an opinion on that? Is, uh, is this not obvious? <laughs> yeah, but, uh, absolutely. But it is, I, I just think, honestly, unless you schedule it, these things don't happen, do they? Yeah, We've just got to make right, it. Uh, we always say to our, our clients, look, yeah, every 90 days, I'm just have a check-in, check it out, make sure everything's relevant, everything's topical. Uh, there's new features coming out all the time. So uh, we're getting people to just you know, make sure they're across, you know, all these new features that are there. Uh, so yeah, every ninety days is a good uh, is a good cadence to do that. That's a good tip. Now, in terms of then um, automation, now talk to me about posting. You know, the the tools out there that can post into LinkedIn, those sort of things. Do you think they're positive, negative, can be detrimental? How do you find them in terms of helping people get a bit more regular with their posting in LinkedIn? It's a good question, and there's two two sides to that coin. So it's, it seems like where you might schedule content, mm-hmm. and that's fine, no problem with that at all. And there's lots of lots of tools like say Hootsuite, Buffer, Meet Edgar. You know, LinkedIn don't have their own scheduling tool like Facebook does. Uh, but uh, and look, there's a lot of this conjecture. Some people say, oh, it's, you, know, you use some scheduling tools, it won't get as much traction. Uh, you know, call BS on that one. Uh, yeah, we've okay. tested that across many, many uh, posts, across many profiles, that's fine. Okay. Uh, so in that context, good. Uh, there's other ones that kind of aggregate content from other places and says, oh, we can automatically post this to Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, yeah, whatever. Uh, those are not good. Because yeah. um, generally speaking, you, know, you can't put any context to it. It's all, all it's doing is pulling in the data information that's on some other website or blog or, or whatever it might be. Uh, and also it's going to be sharing a link to that, that particular piece of content. And LinkedIn do not like content that takes you off the platform in most cases. So, so those types of tools definitely, I would say, steer away from. Uh, and I and just want to – can I just hold you there? Because I think just in case the listener missed that – what you're talking about there is a website link in your post, which I think right. people do intuitively. Like it's something that lots of people will just go, oh, hey, go yeah, here. Yeah. Um, yeah. But what you're saying is LinkedIn don't like you doing that. No, they're going to suppress the, the content, meaning okay. they're not going to stop you posting it. They're just going to make sure pretty much nobody sees it. Yep. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so really the type of content they're looking for is uh, content that keeps people on the platform creates conversation on the platform, that type of thing. So sharing a you know, link to a blog article or whatever is rarely ever going to excite people to do that. Um, so, so yeah, there's, there's, you know, we, could, we could be here all day, Peter, talking <laughs> just about content strategies, but uh, uh, I know we don't have that time. But the um, type of, yeah, so just to your question of those type of scheduling tools are definitely a no-no. Uh, and, of course, the real no-no is the ones that are um, – automating, uh, so uh, connecting with people and Ugh. messaging people, stuff like that. LinkedIn really do not like those ones. And it's just, um, you know, there's a theme with, you know, we've just um, chatted with somebody about Facebook and there's a theme here. These tools are about connection. So that means you actually need to connect. <laughs> like, you know, that's that's the, that's the name of the game here. Um, collecting faceless strangers is not connecting. So no. that's not – and you – look, it's easy to get caught up in the vanity metrics of that, isn't it? It's like, well, you've got, you know, 10,000, 40,000, yeah. however many followers, but but how many of them act? How many of, how many of them actually interact with you? You know, it's – um that's telling to me. That's the thing I'm more interested in. It is. And, you know, it's funny. Uh, I, I have to say I see less and less of it now, thankfully, but – We've all seen it. There's yeah. people who have on their having their profile saying, uh, yeah, their name and uh, eight thousand seven hundred connections. Well, yeah, who cares? Yeah. It's like, you know, or fifteen thousand, whatever the number. The the fact you put a number says you don't care about your connections. You care about the number of connections. Uh, so it's a real red flag. So somebody sends me a connection request and they got that in their profile. And it's, it's, it's gone. Like, yeah. Much. 
And it's it's an interesting lesson, I think, that is is hard when you're first going down this path and you see it a lot on Instagram. I, I had a quick look at your Instagram page there and you've got a, a high number of, of followers on Instagram. But when you look through your posts, you're also getting spammed by people who clearly want you to market product all the time. So, you know, that's not connection either. So, you know, it's we've got to learn that it's it's finding your tribe. That's what that's our job here. And if your tribe is just a hundred or two hundred of very highly connected people, that is a huge win. You know, you've done super well. It is, and look, the day it used to be different, but these days uh, LinkedIn's not impressed by how many connections you have. By the way, the maximum anybody can have doesn't matter who it is, whether it's Richard Branson or Peter, thirty thousand. Um, okay. Now I know that sounds like a lot. Um, however, there is a there is a a cap, uh, so you want to make sure. If, even if you've got thirty thousand, like I do, you want to make sure that they are, they are the the right type of people. However, that makes no difference. Now I could have thirty thousand, and uh, but just for an argument's sake, say so you had five hundred. Mm-hmm. Uh, then it makes no difference now in the level of traction you can get on your content to what I can get. Uh, it's you know you can get as many if you go about your content strategy the right way I, I better put the, that that parenthesis around it mm. uh, if you you have a, a, a properly constructed uh, structured content strategy the numbers of your connections are irrelevant yeah it's it's and it's it's hard to get our heads around that and in finance we're we are about numbers it's easy to get caught up in numbers <laughs> But I think there are, there are good numbers and bad numbers, right. as, as, as we know. Absolutely, so. and I think ultimately we all know impact is really the measure, right? And so whatever your chosen impact is, that's the thing you need to be measuring yourself on. One of the things I I don't know, you know, how much you would um, be able to share or be aware of. What's down the track? Like, what are LinkedIn working on? You know, what are the things that are coming up in the future that we can look forward to or look out for? Yeah, the, wouldn't we all love the the crystal ball yeah. on, on that one? Um, what, what I'll say is that uh, they don't tend to uh, be super open about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, however, what what I can share with you is that uh, new features go through um, uh, s- some certain stages of, of of rollout, which is called alpha, beta, and, and three levels of of uh, release. Alpha means it may not actually go to full. You know, full uh, utilization across the globe, uh, and uh, funnily enough, quite often Australia uh, is picked as a country to test alpha products. And uh, you could look at that in two ways. A lot of people say, "Ah, oh, that's cool. Australia must be an important uh, market for them." It's actually the reverse. It's the it's deemed as well. We're so far away from everywhere else, and we're such a little. <laughs> if we mess uh, it up, it doesn't matter. <laughs> If it, yeah, if it stuffs up, like yeah, who cares about Australia? <laughs> so, so, uh, but funny enough, yeah, we we often get uh, first release on these things. Um, what they're working on right now, is, it, which is in sort of uh, probably just come out of alpha. It's it's, um, it's you know, and in fact, even just through beta, it's now into rollout. Is is uh, believe it or not, a podcasting um, called uh, LinkedIn Audio. Okay. Uh, so it's uh, now. I wouldn't say it's as functional as a. Uh, I would never recommend replacing your traditional podcast with LinkedIn audio. However, you can now create an audio version of um, uh, interaction with people directly on LinkedIn, um, which in certain cases is is great. Uh, the downside is you can't uh, you can't syndicate it across multiple other platforms. You can't uh, store it and stuff outside of LinkedIn that type of stuff. So, uh, but if you're kind of new into podcasting, it uh, it can give you a, a bit of a taste of, of what uh, podcasting is like. I um, guess it's probably is that almost like an audio version of the newsletter? Is that sort of what it's? No, no, it's uh, you think of Clubhouse. Okay. Um, remember that. Remember Clubhouse. It was <laughs> the next next. Biggest thing that was ever going to exist that nobody nobody even remembers now. Yeah, uh, it's that's the easiest comparison. It's it's, it's kind of like uh, LinkedIn's version of, of Club Clubhouse, but directly on on LinkedIn. What I will say is, what's really the future? I can guarantee you what the the, the you don't need a crystal ball for is that it's all about content. So it's gone of the days where it's all about you know he or she who has the most connections and all that sort of stuff. Uh, 
LinkedIn wants to be the place that we all come for really high quality content on subjects that we're interested in. So what they're really working on is is improving the functionality of us being able to have some say in what the, the type of content that we see uh, and being able to flag content we don't like and and uh, signal for content we do like, uh, which improves the quality of stuff we see on their feeds. Mm -hmm. So uh, interestingly enough, though, you'd be very, again, I think you'd be really surprised to know that of the, you know, if you said you know, exactly how do you create a content strategy that LinkedIn loves and is going to give you this massive amount of organic reach and everything like that, uh, it's less than 1% of all the, the people on LinkedIn have any idea of how to or that are at least even implementing a strategy like that. So wow. the, what I would say is it is a target-rich, uh, untapped uh, resource if you, if, you can, if you get it right, where the organic reach that you can get to the right type of people, uh, and they're putting in place all the metrics so you can see with your content, like who are the people who are seeing it, what industries are they in, what locations are they in, what companies are they from. You can see all this information on your content now, uh, and that is the future. And so the game is going to be won by the content creators that create really high-quality content. That High-quality content is not uh, often promotional content. Mm. Uh, it's not like selling the product and service. Of course, there is a place for that as well, uh, but... You know, the, the real long term, yeah, well, it's not even long term, it's here right now. It's just that only you know, less than 1% of the 850 million people on there uh, understand it and utilize it. Uh, but that is, that is the future. And I think that's probably, that's probably something you can't say about most of the platforms, right? So you can't, most of them, you can't say that, that the majority of users aren't really utilizing it to its full extent. You'd probably say the reverse. You'd probably say this. You know, most people are just pushing stuff out in these high volume. Whereas, whereas um, you know, and I've heard that from a few different places. You know, LinkedIn is this thing that people just haven't tapped into. Um, and that's okay if it's not your niche, but that means that people that work – aren't your niche. And that might be the case, but I would argue most advisors, you know, work with people with role jobs or business owners or like most of them are going to be on there. And if not, it's a great thing to even introduce people to. Gee, I noticed you don't have a LinkedIn profile. Why not? You know, like it's, this is something that for most people there would be value in that. Um, so yeah, I, I think um, that's an interesting insight that makes you, it'll make everybody, I think, as they listen, question where your effort lies, you know, um, and making sure that you just sort of don't spread yourself too thin. Why not dive into something and do it really well? And maybe LinkedIn might be that, you know, for the listener. Yeah. And and just to maybe expand on that a little bit, uh, even if potentially your, your main market is not on LinkedIn and in financial advisory, uh, well, I can guarantee you it, not, in 95% of the cases that will be. Yeah. But even if they weren't, uh, it's still a place where you can build a lot of credibility uh, yeah, by you know, creating this con great content and getting a lot of interaction and engagement there so that when you are having people check you out, interesting thing, if you Google, uh, none of us do it ever, do we, Peter, we'll Google our own names, we never <laughs> do that, but I guarantee you if you uh, were, were to do that today, that the number one thing that will come up in that search will be your LinkedIn profile. Mm -hmm. oh, the only reason ever where it won't be is if you have a personal website. Like, I don't mean a company wide. Um, so, for say, for me, uh, yeah, we have our company website, Commerce Global. I also have, you know, for my you know, speaking uh, you know, roles, uh, a personal website, yeah. which is at willhand.com. So, that will often come up first. Yep. Uh, but from the higher majority of people, if, if ever uh, our name gets Googled, our LinkedIn profile is going to come up number one. And really, if, if you think about it, if somebody's interested in, in reaching out to you for something as important as financial advice, they're going to do their research. They're going to check you out. They're going to, they're going to, they're, and how do we do that? We do a Google search. Uh, and the first thing they're going to see is your LinkedIn profile. They're going to click on it. And if it looks like rubbish, then, um, you know, you kind of come across that way. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's, that's probably something we underrate, isn't it? That, that, well, you might have a business website and it might have your headshot and your description, but there's a good chance that won't be where they're sent first. You know, if they Google you, it's probably going to be a LinkedIn profile. So why not give it 
you know, the attention it deserves uh, and make sure not only does it look great, of course, but also that it represents you, you know, that you're really capturing, you know, who you are on your LinkedIn page. And if I could, again, I'll just really quickly give you another little case study on that. Um, Recently, uh, one of our clients uh, contacted me and said, oh, I just, he's a mortgage broker. And uh, he said, oh, just, I just want a, um, uh, a contract to do a uh, $5 million uh, finance for a, a commercial property right from LinkedIn. I didn't have to do anything. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, uh, when I spoke to this person, uh, I asked them, like, how did you find out about me? And they said, well, I actually spoke to a friend of mine who recommended one of your competitors uh, and gave me a link to their LinkedIn profile. When I went on there, uh, it had a link to your profile uh, as someone that you, know, you should also check out. And yours just looked so much more appealing than the person that I was personally referred to. I ended up coming to you instead of them. So there you go. It's the difference, power of a, um, you know, a, a professional um, presence on LinkedIn, uh, where he didn't even, it wasn't even the search for him. It was for someone else. That's, that's such a good tip. I feel like, um, you know, that's the representation. In the old days, it's like if you had a ratty business card that got scrunched up in your pocket and you handed that over to somebody, that's what we're doing. If we're not, keeping our LinkedIn profile uh, lickety split and, you know, and particularly personable, you know, and sincere and capturing who we are, then you are not doing yourself any favors. It's essentially, for most people, it's probably the closest they'll ever have to a personal website. Uh, I, uh, exactly. Yeah. And to be honest, uh, Peter, it's actually more SEO optimized than what your personal website could ever be. Um, so it's, if you like, if, Someone said to me, I can, I've only got the budget to do one or the other. I'd say do your LinkedIn profile all day. Yeah, it's good advice, good advice. Anything we've missed? I feel like we've covered a lot. Yeah, I think we, we've covered a lot. I can guarantee you when we jump off this, I'll go, oh, we should have thought about that. But uh, <laughs> I think, uh, I think, look, overall, we've, uh, we've covered a lot of ground. And hopefully, it's been uh, of value to uh, everyone uh, tuning in. Look, I think undoubtedly, you know, the listeners are going to want to find out more about you, Adam. So we're going to include Adam's website link in the show notes, along with his LinkedIn profile, which in this particular instance, I think would be the first place everybody should look. There's a lot of lessons just from looking at what Adam's doing in his profile. Um, I'd also personally encourage you to attend one of his uh, free web events. Once you follow him on LinkedIn, then he does mention those as they're coming up and, and, you know, it's constant updates about what's changing, you know, what's new in LinkedIn, but also reminding you of of behaviors or, you know, strategies and content strategies and things like that. I've found them really valuable. So I'd encourage all of you um, to do that too. Thank you so much for joining us, Adam. I've really got huge, I mean, I've got huge amounts of notes I've written down as we've been doing the interview. So if nobody else finds it valuable, I certainly did. So thank you so much for your time. It's an absolute pleasure. Absolutely enjoyed it. And Hopefully we'll do it again sometime in uh, the, the future. With a new update. Done. I'll see you then. So could it be that you are one of the 99% of LinkedIn users that aren't really utilizing the tool to its full capability? You know, do you did anything we were talking about really prompt you to think? You know, please share your insights on the XY platform. Um, maybe even, you know, share your LinkedIn profile on there and ask for some feedback. You know, we're all here to help each other out. The XY platform is a great way to do that. So be sure, ask for assistance, ask people to share their profiles so you can all take a look um, and certainly take a look at Adams and get some insights from there. And in terms of my thoughts, I guess what I would say is, you know, that was a bit of a, a um, eye-opening moment for me when, you know, you realize LinkedIn really is your personal website. This is, <laughs> this is really the best version you're going to have of your own website on you and what, what you like to talk about. Um, and that's why it's so important that it truly reflects you. Um, to give you some insight, um, you probably have already seen a theme with – the interviews I do on the pod, I do this wacky introduction. Um, and those where I come up with all sorts of different backgrounds about the individual I'm interviewing and, and some, you know, things that might create more interest. And that is, 
either easy or incredibly difficult depending on how well people's LinkedIn profiles and other social media profiles really represent them as both professionals but also as human beings. Um, and so sometimes it's super quick because, uh, you know, they have all of that background in there and I can see some personality in their posts and I can grab some little insights and sometimes I struggle, I struggle to come up with one or two points. So, you know, this is a page that really represents you and whether you think people are looking at it or not, they almost certainly are. So I think it's worth all of our time, you know, to just really uh, lean into upgrading um, the quality of the content there, taking advantage of the different elements and making sure we're on top of all the different features we can use. So, all righty then, we need to get those curiosity muscles working a bit more. You know, each week we're going to be doing this. I'm going to bring to your attention another app or something that I came across. And given we're in the sort of professional office space with LinkedIn being our interview today, then the app I'd love you to take a look at is called Hyper Context. And you can find them at hypercontext.com. Now, this is a tool that helps you streamline internal meetings, team goals, and sort of get everybody's morale all on the one page and create automatic workflows that help make this much easier. Now, this can turn sort of really dull or even awkward one-on-one -on -one meetings into things, into meetings that have high impact and high impact discussions. You know, your team member could take an ownership of the one-on-one -on -one agenda. They can share their feedback on some things that you wanted to talk about. You can assign follow-ups, you know, that you can really foster accountability in a team. And it even has 500 conversation starters to get that sort of meeting going so that it can get people conversing and relaxing. In terms of team meetings, then, you know, your meetings, you know, they sit in your calendar, whichever one you use. It could be um, Outlook. It could be uh, Google Calendar like we use. Then HyperContext sits within the meeting when it's booked in your calendar. So it's got a, a button there that when you open the appointment for the meeting, you click on Take Me to HyperContext and there the agenda sits. Um, and so once again, then the team can see what it, what they're going to be covering. They can take notes. They can add links. They can add images so that when you get to your weekly team meeting or however on it is, whatever the topic is, they've already added in all the things they wanted to cover. Now, during the meeting, you know, team members can add comments. You can assign tasks or follow-ups to different team members. And once the team meeting is done, then the minutes of that meeting, essentially the, the way you've been interacting with the agenda and the follow-up tasks, get automatically sent to all the attendees. So it's just one of those narrow tools that just streamlines a particular functionality for a business. I think we'd all agree that internal meetings can get a bit dry. They can struggle. Uh, we maybe lack a bit of structure. Um, and also it's difficult for people to remember what they want to cover. They can at any point go, oh, I want to bring that up in the team meeting. They go to the calendar appointment. They open it up click on the hyper context agenda and they just add it and it'll appear then when it, when the meeting starts. So I'd encourage you to check it out. Well, that's all we've got for this week. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you'll get your advice tech fix magically sent to you each Friday. And if you'd like a speaker at your next event or you'd love to suggest me as a speaker for the next event you attend, um, then I'd love to talk to your audience on the seven habits of bionic advisors and the secrets to tech-powered human-centric advice. Please reach out to me on LinkedIn if that's uh, something of interest. My LinkedIn profile is PeterMD, P-E-I-T-A-M-D. Otherwise, I'll look forward to turning up in your earbuds next week and remember, advice explorers, stay curious.